There are major conflicts between biblical history and secular history. We get questions like, were the pyramids built before the flood? And things like that. We're going to cover that in this show, but if you are new to this, you might want to refer to our first video in this series. You might want to just stop here, go back and watch that one first. It's called The Biblical Age of the Earth. I'm Dr. Robert Carter. I'm in the studio today with my dear friend, Lita Kosner. Hey, Lita. Hi, Rob. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun on this one. We've been uh, laughing and joking our way all the way through all various heresies and mistakes that we can make. Uh, but the question today is going to deal with uh, certain aspects of figuring out how old the Earth is. So, Lita, let me ask you just a direct question right away. Secular archaeology tells us that the pyramids in Egypt were built before the Bible says Noah's flood happened. Is that true? Of course it's not. And that's because the Egyptian chronology is inflated. And this is an area that has a lot of pitfalls for the amateur, the person who's coming in from outside the standard academic stream of scholarship. And, and I've made some mistakes along the way, and so have you. We've learned yes. a lot as we studied this. But what can we tell people? Just, you know, do we have a 30-second, you know, the Bible claims this, secular history claims this, the Bible must be wrong? What do we tell them? Well, first we have to look at how do they get those Egyptian dates. And, okay, very good question. And so to look at that, we have to look at somebody called Manetho, who was an Egyptian historian in about the 3rd century BC. Okay. He was writing this propagandistic history for the rulers at the time who were called the Ptolemies. They wanted to connect themselves with the with the long tradition of Egyptian pharaohs. Okay, but why weren't they connected to the long tradition of Egyptian pharaohs? Because they were actually Greeks. Well, that's right. Ptolemy was one of Alexander the Great's generals, and when Alexander died, Ptolemy got Egypt and started a long line of, call them pharaohs if you want, ends in Cleopatra, the famous Cleopatra in, in Roman times, and they're trying to legitimize their rule over Egypt? Exactly, and so okay. they want to establish continuity with this long line of pharaohs. And so Manetho is their propagandistic historian who's writing okay. this up for them. He's also competing with other propagandistic historians from other Like Barossus, who's in Babylonia, who's trying to give the Babylonian Greeks, it's kind of weird to say that, but, you know, the Babylonian wing of Alexander's empire, legitimacy also. Yes. Okay. So did Manetho in Egypt make mistakes? Well, yes, and everybody who's who's in the conversation agrees on this. Secular okay. Egyptologists, Christians, everybody agrees that Manetho got a lot of things wrong. Okay. He didn't re recognize that there were places where there were co-regencies, where two pharaohs were reigning at once. Like a father and a son, which yes. would re reduce the amount of time. Okay. Yes. There were times when the when Egypt was divided, so there was a pharaoh in the north and a pharaoh in the south. And there's times it divided up into even more little provinces than that. Exactly. Okay. And so he just took all those names and strung them together? Yes. Ah, so Egyptian history has to be collapsed, and we know this. Yes. Now, how much and where, everyone argues about. Yes. Okay, but we know it has to be collapsed. Yes. All right. Okay, so we can put that question aside... Let's dig into the scripture and figure out how long ago the flood was and creation was. Now, in our last video together, we talked about, you know, 4004 BC, you know, the, the earth's a little more than 6,000 years old, according to the Bible. Okay. But we also talked about something called the Septuagint that gives 1,600 extra years. But there's another biblical branch if we could call it that, a biblical family of manuscripts, and it comes to us from who? From the Samaritan people. The Samaritan people. Well, Samaritans talk about in the New Testament. Yes. The, the, the Good Samaritan, that famous parable, and Jesus visits the woman at the well in Samaria. Yes. Okay. Who are the Samaritans? The Samaritans are the people who were left behind when the rest of the Jews were taken into exile. They, 586 it, B.C., Actually, the earlier one. Oh, the early, oh, of course, because they're in the north. They're yes. in the northern half of Israel. Yeah. So it's when the Assyrians destroyed yeah. so the they northern were, Israel. Okay. They, they were left behind in the Assyrian exile. Okay. Um, they intermarried with other people who came in. Yeah. And then when the Jews returned, they viewed these people as half-breeds. 
Okay. The Samaritans had some beliefs that were different from the Jews. For one thing, they only uh, viewed the five books of Moses, the Torah, or the Pentateuch. Okay, that's where we get the Samaritan Pentateuch, five yes. books. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, they only viewed those as scripture. They didn't have all of the other books of the Old Testament. Okay. Now, how is the Samaritan Pentateuch different than the Masoretic Pentateuch? Well, we know that they made intentional systematic changes to their scriptures to legitimize their claim to be the true descendants of Abraham. Like they have the temple being built on Mount Gerizim. Yes. Not in Jerusalem. Right. Okay, any other differences? Because we're talking about chronolo chron hmm, chron chron chronology. We're talking about chronology. Yes. All right. Are there any other differences? I mean, we're talking about chronology here. That's the important stuff. Yes. Um, their chronology is slightly shorter than the chronology in our Bibles, which is based on the Masoretic text. Oh, but don't, doesn't their Genesis 5 parallel the Septuagint numbers? Doesn't their Genesis 5 parallel, parallel Masoretic? I thought Genesis 5 parallel... Are you sure? Our, Genesis our, our, 11 our, is not neither. Can, can I see your tablet? Well, viewers, you might notice that the books here just got rearranged a little bit. We just had a fact-checking episode when I made a statement, and Lita said, no, that's not true. Oop. And so we had to go check it, and it turns out that um, I was wrong, and she was right again. But um, the, the question was, um, the Samaritan Pentateuch, which numbers does it use? Is it more similar to the Septuagint or more similar to the Masoretic? And the answer was... The answer was it was more similar to the Masoretic. But it's not exactly the same as the Masoretic. It's got a lot of differences and it ends up being shorter. Yes. All right. So we've got these three different textual families. The Hebrew, Masoretic, which is the basis of our Old Testament. The Greek, Septuagint, which is a translation made second century B.C., and has got big number differences where someone deliberately took 100 years here and moved it over to here and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Samaritan Pentateuch, which most scholars don't consider highly accurate. Well, everybody knows the Samaritan Pentateuch is not reflecting the original. The okay, reason it's called a recension. That's a big scholarly word. Yes. Okay, which means a deliberate alteration. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So everybody agrees that the Samaritan Pentateuch is not original. Okay. The reason it's important is because now we have three variant texts that came from an original. And what text critics do is they look at each variant. Each text is called a variant. Yes. And they try to figure out, okay, what's the most likely text history that gives us these three texts from one individual? And we did that. Yes. And we worked very hard on this. Yes. And we came up with what's called a consensus? Well, or... it's, a, it's a parsimonious reconstruction. Oh, oh, parsimonious reconstruction. Okay, okay. big words. But parsimonious means... <laughs> yes. The most simple. Yes. Basically, okay. how do you get from this one text to these three texts with the fewest number of changes? Okay, now, in genetics, we talk about parsimony a lot. Yeah. When we look at gene sequences between these different species, and you know, what's the most parsimonious explanation is something we do a lot. Yes. So we applied that thought to scripture. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's the simplest possible reconstruction. Yeah. When you're looking at all three of these text families, the people copying them believed that they were dealing with the word of God. And so they would have dealt very carefully with it. Okay. And so we probably don't need a lot more changes than are absolutely necessary. A parsimonious reconstruction doesn't tell us what actually happened. It just gives us a good starting point because it gives us the most simple pathway. Okay, okay. And when we did this, we concluded it's very easy to start with the Masoretic and develop the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch. Yes. But it's very difficult to start with the Septuagint and develop the Masoretic and the Samaritan Pentateuch. That's correct. Okay, so from a scholarly viewpoint, from a text-critical viewpoint, from a, the viewpoint of parsimony, big word, sorry everybody, but you got to talk about big words when you're talking about scholarship. 
it looks like the Masoretic is a great candidate for being original, and the others look like they've been modified. That's correct. And this isn't just our conclusion. It's the conclusion of practically every text critic who has looked at the issue. For a couple thousand years. Yes. At least, when talking about the early church fathers, not all of them could read Hebrew. But for those who could, it's something you taught me. Yes. For those who could... The... The church fathers who could read Greek and Hebrew and who were in the best position to weigh all of the available evidence uniformly came down on the side of the Masoretic text. Okay. Very interesting. Now, when we're looking at all these numbers, we're looking at variance between manuscripts and between the, the families of manuscripts. What is the one thing that varies the most? Well, that would be numbers. Numbers. I don't know why necessarily, but if something about writing down numbers, people make a lot of mistakes. Well, if you think about it, if you change a number, if you add a zero or you take away a zero or you, changing a figure isn't necessarily going to change the meaning of the text in the same way as changing a verb or changing a yeah. noun. Yeah. He lived. He died. That's a big difference. Yeah. But seven or nine. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then once it's written down, the next guy who's reading it, he doesn't know the original might have been a seven. There's a nine there. Right. Okay. And so... What we see most differences amongst these manuscripts are numbers. Yes. And so when we're talking about the age of the earth, chronology, we're actually talking about the most variable parts of these old manuscripts. Yes. So how do we tell someone, maybe a young Christian or, or someone who's just delving into this, that the Bible's not full of errors? Well, don't, don't, doesn't, don't these differences mean the Bible has lots of mistakes in it? How do we know which is the original? Questions like that. What do we tell them? Well, it's very similar to people who ask us about the long ending of Mark or, you know, textual differences in the New Testament. We have a lot of evidence for the textual history of the entire Bible, both the Old okay. and New Testaments. Okay. And people have been wrestling with these issues for thousands of years. This is and true. they've come. And faithful Christians throughout history have come to the same conclusions over and over again. And it's very good news for us because it means that we can trust this book. Okay. So the variants that we see are minor. They're not doctrinally problematic. And most of the time we can do a historical reconstruction and figure out what the original was. Yes. With a high degree of precision and um, confidence. Yes. All right, that's really cool. That's exciting and good to know. Because when you get into this text criticism question, oh my, people get angry, they start asking lots of questions, uh, people can wander away from the faith when they, they realize that there's all these unknowns in the Bible. Yeah, well, you can understand why, because this is the Word of God we're talking about, and it's very important. Yeah. But when you start to get into some people who believe that the Septuagint is a superior um, timeline, you, you get these well-meaning, godly people who are unfortunately not making very good arguments. Their scholarship is not as serious as the topic warrants. And we found that out as we started digging into the arguments. In, in fact, um, just so everybody knows, uh, Lita and I came to the table a couple years ago, and we said, we want to know what the Bible says on the subject, and we want to know which one is the original, and we were willing to be persuaded by the Septuagint advocates and the Septuagint. Yes. And so we try to be as neutral as possible, and we wrote this down in several articles that we've done. But in the end, when we examined all the arguments and all the data for the Septuagint, it fell apart. And some people don't know that because you get online, you watch a YouTube video, and it seems like such a good argument that, you know, the question, were the pyramids built before the flood? Well, of course they weren't, and if you use the Septuagint Bible, then you, the dating works out and the pyramids are built after the flood, just like the Bible indicates. It, of course, doesn't answer all the historical questions, not even remotely. Yeah. But the newbie getting into this has got a lot of misinformation you have to wade through. Correct. And the, the problem is that you think you're solving one problem, but really you're creating a whole lot of other problems because if the correct chronology is only preserved in the Septuagint translation, that raises a lot of questions about the preservation of Scripture and even inerrancy. Yeah, huge questions. 
Huge questions. You also have to have, um, as we pointed out in a very important article, um, you have to have a grand conspiracy mm -hmm. where somebody changes the Bible and then propagates it. Yes. And it's not just a textual question. It's a historical question. Because if you believe, like some of the Septuagint advocates believe, that there was a rabbi in the first century who had this grand conspiracy to change the Old Testament, to change the timing so that Jesus wouldn't, couldn't be the Messiah, you have to have an army of scribes, a huge fortune to pay for those scribes to, to create thousands of Torah scrolls. Which take, take them, years each to make. Take them all the way from India to Spain, that is, that is the area where the Jewish people were living. Exactly. And convince every single rabbi to burn his old Torah scroll and replace it. Now we're talking about the if the Septuagint is the original, some of the Septuagint advocates are saying that the Masoretic Bible wasn't invented until the second century. Yeah, but inconveniently for them, we have strong evidence of all three text types. Yes. By the time of Jesus. Yes, before the time of Jesus even. Yes. Okay, so it can't happen the way they say it, and plus there is zero evidence for this grand conspiracy. Nobody wrote about it. It would Precisely. have been hugely controversial. It's never discussed. It There's yeah. just no evidence for it. Yeah, you would have needed the Jewish equivalent of the Pope, which didn't exist. Yeah, and then there would have been controversy because the Pope makes a change, people argue about it, and it's written down. Yeah. The Jews wrote a lot of things down. We don't know anything about controversial Popes today, do we? No, 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 of course not. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more that we could cover. We just skim the surface. Please dig deeply. Don't just go off half cock thinking you have the answer. Um, you might be surprised by some of the information that's out there. I mean, we got sitting on the table here something called the pseudo-epigrapha. That's the false writings. Writings that aren't in the Bible, but we know they exist from scholarship. And we, you know, we've read a lot of this. Lita specifically has read a lot of this in order to figure out some of these questions. Scholarship is not something to scoff at, but it's also not something to just take on without questioning. So please question us. Do it. Dig into this material. See if you can figure out something we missed. We would love to hear from you. But before you comment again, like we said last time, make sure you know what you're talking about. There's a lot of very easy comments to make, and we hear them a lot, but it doesn't mean that they're scholarly or accurate or even sometimes worth answering. It can be really frustrating to hear the same thing again and again and again and again. That's already been answered clearly. So dig in, do your research, do your homework. Maybe we'll get a, a good conversation on this topic in the comment section below. We got a lot of information at creation.com, but you also might want to read your Bibles. Read it cover to cover, study it, study it, study it. There's some amazing information in there, and the best part about it is it tells us how to get to heaven.